Shalom from uh, Galilee. I'm right by the Sea of Galilee. It's nighttime here. It's 8 p.m. And I'm so happy to be back here live on Facebook. Something that will eventually turn into um, YouTube um, uh, video as well. And this is a great opportunity to be able to share with you guys um, on several things. Uh, we have a lot to do this evening. The first thing is, of course, to uh, talk a little bit about what's going on right now, just for a few minutes. But then uh, we're going to go and try to put a, a, some order in the Christian confusion regarding Bible prophecy and things that are happening and will happen in the future. So... Um, before we do that, first of all, I want to tell you thank you for so uh, many comments and so much support that we have from you guys in regards to what we're doing. The ministry is really growing and we're so excited about uh, what God is doing uh, through the ministry in the lives of uh, hundreds of thousands of people across the globe and to God be the glory. So we're happy, we're excited about it. and. And now I think it's the right time to share with you something uh, very exciting. But before we start, maybe we should pray and, and then we move on. Okay, so Father, we thank you so much that you will uh, preside over this whole Facebook Live uh, session right now. Um, this is a very important event. This is a very important topic. We know that it is so dear to your heart. And so Father, we ask that you will you will uh, take over the whole technical aspect, the internet, uh, the cameras, the, the microphone, and of course, the content, that it will be your word and not uh, our own interpretation. We thank you, Father, and we ask that uh, through your word, you will bless your people. And we ask all of this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So, first thing first. I wanted to share with you uh, wonderful, wonderful news. Um, there's a lot of stuff that uh, we do, a lot of uh, teachings that we do, uh, and I was thinking about what is the best way, A, to promote it around the world, and at the same time to bless people that financially cannot afford coming to Israel. And uh, as I was praying and asking the Lord about this, um, I came up with, I guess, a great idea um, in that to um, have a raffle, basically. Um, and in order to have the raffle where the prize is going to be a free tour with me to Israel next year. And by the way, uh, we might actually add you to the tour that myself and J.D. Farag will host together. We're going to host a Bible prophecy study tour in November of 2018. So that might be the tour we're going to put you on. But in order to do that, um, you're going to have to help us. You're going to have to do your share of trying to share and spread the message of Behold Israel ministry. So I'm going to give you five very simple steps that you can do in order to be part of this. The more steps you take, the higher your chance to win. Um, but even if you did one, that'll at least help us to know who you are because all the steps I'm asking you to do, A, are about to share the message. B, it's our way to identify you as a participant in this raffle. So the first thing we want you to do, if you haven't done so, go to our website, beholdisrael.org, and just subscribe to our newsletter. This way we have your email, we have your name, and we know that you exist, and so you can be part of the raffle. And when you do that, um, you can just write us um, um, and, and let us know. So again, go and subscribe on our newsletter on our website, beholdisrael.org. The second thing, go to our web, uh, Facebook page, Behold Israel, the Facebook page, Behold Israel, and um, like, follow, and share our post about how to win a free tour to Israel. Share it with as many people 
And when you do that, please put hashtag Behold Israel, one word. That will allow us to find you. Hashtag Behold Israel, one word. And, um, and, do th and share it with as many as you can. The third thing, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Behold Israel. And once you subscribe, you can comment on our YouTube videos with hashtag Behold Israel. And that, again, will allow us to identify you easily. Fourth, follow and share our Instagram. Instagram is Behold Israel, one word. Follow us. We want to see you there. And just you can like our pictures and also there write us hashtag Behold Israel. Again, the minute you do that, it's very easy to find you. The last is on Twitter. Follow us on Twitter and retweet our Twitter post uh, about how to win a tour to Israel, again, use hashtag Behold Israel. Every time you put hashtag Behold Israel or handle or handle at Behold Israel, it'll allow us to find you, add your name to the raffle, and um, that will help us to indicate that you're part of this. Remember, if you did all that I just described, your chances of winning are five times more likely as um, and we will enter your name from all these platforms. So your name will be five times there. So it's much easier to win. And as, as I was praying about all of that, I thought to myself, what if, you know, so it's only one person getting an Israel tour. How can I bless more people? So first of all, um, I want to give you another prize. Uh, and, and if you're not on the Israel tour, uh, we're going to pay your flight and hotel accommodation. Um, when it comes to the 2017 October 7 um, Understanding the Times conference of Jan Markell and Olive Tree Ministries. I will be one of the speakers there, J.D. Farag, Pastor Mark, Mark Hitchcock, as well as um, Michelle Barkman. And this will be a wonderful full-day conference. And if you're going to be our guest because you won the second prize of this raffle, I will also have lunch with you there and we can talk face to face on Bible and, and life. Third, if you didn't win the Israel tour and you didn't win the uh, Understanding the Times conference, we want still to bless you and we're going to just send you a box full of all of my DVDs as well as a Hebrew English Bible dedicated by me, signed by me. And if my book, which I'm writing right now, which is called The Last Hour, if it will come out um, fast enough, I will also say, send you a signed copy of my own book. The book is in the final process of, of, of writing and we're still um, negotiating with publishers and hopefully by September it will come out. So these are the great news about a way to bless you guys and especially if you cannot afford um, an Israel tour. It's a wonderful way, I believe, A, to spread the message of Behold Israel, of uh, Bible prophecy and what's going on in the world today, as well as help a, a person who cannot afford to come to Israel and be blessed with a wonderful tour through the land. So I'm just telling you guys, don't wait. Just do those things, those five steps, and get the message out there. We want you to get the message out there, and we want to bless you for doing that. So help us bless you for doing that. Now, there's a lot of things that are going on in the world right now. And um, one of the things that uh, obviously you know is the chaos that is going on in Europe right now. I I've talked about Sweden, and I know that President Trump said something. He may have, he may have mentioned it in a wrong way. He should have talked about the situation and not a specific event because Malmo, for example, is the capital of rape now in Europe. Um, and not only that, there's so many other events in France. There are riots almost on a daily basis. We're talking about Paris. Uh, uh, we're talking about um, uh, other, um, other cities across the, uh, France, which the media is no longer even reporting. Uh, it, it had become a daily practice over there. Um, but also, um, just so you know, um, 
in the in the middle of March of, of this year, in Holland, in the Netherlands, there will be elections, and uh, it's going to be very interesting to see who is going to win because the uh, the uh, the candidate uh, Wilders, um, he's basically the one that is um, very strong, coming very very strong, and he's anti the Muslim invasion into into his country and what it's actually turning the, the Netherlands into. The politically correct Europe is coming to almost an end. The Europeans wake up to see that their, their continent has been robbed from them, basically. And um, as I said before, I believe that eventually what's going to turn out of Europe is, okay, you guys aren't going to win we're going to strip Europe off religion completely and just adopt some sort of a neutralized religion where all ways are, are, are okay and all ways leads to God and all the only thing you need to do is basically be a good person. Watch my message online on, on the rise of the one world religion and it speaks of how the Catholic Church is spearheading that effort uh, to eventually uh, do that. Now, uh, we come to the actual topic of the message this evening, and it is, what's next in Bible prophecy? Uh, unfortunately, I've, I've heard so many bad, wrong teachings, um, and I'm basing my teachings really not on anything but two things, the Bible and world events. Of course, the Bible is most important thing but we live in this world and we can look around and understand the things that had happened things that are, are happening and things that are in preparation uh, uh, in, in, in we, we can see the stage getting ready so we, we can't really detach ourselves with what's going on in the world in, in fact it's interesting when Jesus was approached by the disciples um, and they asked him that question, what do you think uh, are the signs of the end of the age? It's very interesting that he talked about world events. He didn't talk about only, you know, uh, scriptures. Uh, thus, it, uh, you know, uh, it is said so, and that, uh, thus uh, said the Lord that. And no, he actually described world events. Events. In fact, Jesus wasn't angry that they were asking this question. The Bible says that when he came out of the temple and, and, and he was going away, when his disciples came to point out that the temple buildings uh, were there to him, and then he said to them, Do you not see that all these things, truly I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another which will not be torn down? Basically, Jesus said, Don't get used to this world. Things are going to change. Things are going to uh, to surprise you, especially when you're we're not when you're not ready. When you think that this is it, that's the best as, as best as it can get. And and it's interesting because they then came to him. It almost like started a spark in their eyes and in their mind. Wait a minute, you want to tell us that this amazing temple, that unbelievable building, that took years for Herod the Great to build. This unbelievable, majestic uh, structure is going to be gone? Wait a minute. What else do you know that we don't know? So they came and basically they asked him three things. They said, when, they, they, when he was sitting on Mount of Olives, the disciple came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Three different questions that they asked him. And by the way, Pay attention, they asked him that privately. It was something that bothered them, but they were a little bit concerned that other people might hear and um, sort of almost like how the church is acting today. If you really think about it, 90% of Christians do not teach Bible prophecy in churches. They're afraid of it. And so it leaves very, very few people in the church that, is, that are dealing with the things that matter so much. And in fact, if Bible prophecy wasn't so important, why would Jesus 
take the time, sit down on Mount of Olives, and as a teacher, give his, whole, his disciples a whole chapter in our Bible about the coming world events. Now remember, he has to uh, answer three different questions. He has to answer one, when will the destruction of the temple is going to be? And that, of course, happened in 70 AD. But then he asked, also answered about the signs of his coming and, of course, about the sign of the end of the age. So, first of all, it is legitimate to want to know what the signs of the end are and what the future is about to bring. So when we talk about what's next in Bible prophecy, you don't have to feel weird that you are prophecy junkies. No, you have the same exact spark and desire that the disciples had 2,000 years ago, which Jesus, by the way, responded to in a very gracious way and took it very seriously and gave what we know as the Olivet Discourse. So it's important to me that you understand that it is extremely legitimate. In fact, it is, in, I would say, um, I, I would encourage you to ask those questions. These questions bothered the disciples then as much as they should bother all of us today. But what they did not have, which is his teaching, we have today. When they asked that question, they had the entire Old Testament. They had the book of, of, of Jeremiah and, and, and the book of Ezekiel and the book of Isaiah and the book of Daniel and the book of Zechariah and even the book of Psalms. I mean, all that those people and those, the, the writers of those books wrote was already part of what the Jewish people had in mind. And yet, they didn't understand it. It took Jesus a whole chapter to teach them the right sequence of events. And, and I think that it's important that we understand that... Um, you know, there's a lot of people that are trying to stay away from the Old Testament, saying, you know, it's not that valid anymore. Or some other pastor I heard that said that the entire counsel of God is in the New Testament. Therefore, Old Testament shouldn't even be taught on Sunday morning in churches. Guys, most of Bible prophecy, most of what God is trying to tell his people regarding the end times is actually in the Old Testament. And Jesus was shedding light on that which has already been written regarding the end times. And that is exactly why they needed him to put an order in that mess that they had in their mind. Um, so let, let, let's begin with, you know, Matthew 24, when he basically said all of that. Now, it's important that you understand that um, we are... We're witnessing a teaching of Jesus concerning three things, not one. He taught them about the temple itself. And then he taught them about the signs of his coming and the sign, the sign of the age, of the end of the age. The same actually was done by Daniel the prophet. Daniel, by the way, in the um, seventh chapter was speaking about the Antichrist and about, you know, how Jesus comes back um, and the ancient of days and all of that. But in the ninth chapter, and bear in mind, prophecies don't have to be in chronological order when the prophets wrote them because they were given revelations. They were given um, uh, some interesting understandings uh, um, of events, not necessarily in the order that we will have. Uh, for example, Daniel 9 is something that precedes Daniel 7. Um, we, 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 we see that um, also in Zechariah, we see the same. In, in, in Ezekiel, we see the same. But, but I want you to, to understand that in, in Daniel 9, we, 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 we hear about those 70 weeks that were determined upon the people of Israel and the temple. You have to understand, when, when Daniel was writing that, a whole prophecy in chapter 9, uh, he is basically saying, first of all, he started praying for his own nation. The Bible says um, that in the first year of the reign, I, Daniel, observed in the book of Numbers, of uh, the, uh, 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 the numbers of the years which was revealed at the word of God to Jeremiah the prophet, 
about the desolation of Jerusalem. And then he says, So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, not only confessed the sins of him, but also the sins of his entire nation. But then when, we, when he talked about the 70 weeks, he said, now while I was speaking in verse 20 and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering, and he gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. And look what he says. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. Your people and your holy city. So you have to remember that you can, God is not done with Israel. Seventy weeks are not just about the world history. It's about Israel and Jerusalem. And these two things cannot be separated. So if you think that God is done with Israel, you better kiss that, that goodbye. In the same thing, in, in Jeremiah 31, verse 35, as long as the stars and the moons and the sun are there, Israel is a nation before me. God is very clearly indicating that Whatever you teach about Bible prophecy, he's not done with Israel or with Jerusalem until the very, very, very end. So, you have to understand that even the prophecy that Daniel received about the 70 weeks, 70 weeks are 70 times 7, 70 years times 7, 490 years. We're talking about um, an amazing number of days that... Um, uh, were given, but then he separates. He says 62 and 7 are one part, and then the last 7 will be different. And then he talks about the 7 and the 62, the 69 ones that are exactly 173,800 um, days um, from the day the decree to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem was given to Nehemiah by King Artaxerxes. And it's very interesting because that brings us to April 6, 32 AD, which, which was the week of the entrance of Jesus, and that's the week of Passover of that year. So we know that he's talking about Jesus' coming into Jerusalem. He gives us an exact day of his entrance into the city. And then not only that, he talks about the fact in verse 26... Then after the 62 weeks, he says 7 and 62, which is 69. Then after that, you see that the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing in the Hebrew, which means for nothing that he did wrong. And then it says, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So Daniel says, first of all, there's exact number that was determined from the day the decree to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem was given, all the way to the entrance of the Messiah to Jerusalem, and to that weekend where he's cut off, he's actually executed for nothing that he did wrong, exactly um, 69 weeks. And then when he talks about the last seven years, he basically says, so, so he speaks about Jerusalem had to be destroyed. This is a thing of the past. It's gone. So why would he talk about 70 weeks that are, have been determined on, uh, uh, regarding Israel and Jerusalem? It's because 69 weeks already passed. And then Jesus came. And then the church era had officially begun. When he died, you know, a new covenant was given out to Israel. A new covenant, by the way, that is described in Jeremiah chapter 31. So we see that Daniel chapter 9, the 69 weeks have happened. A new covenant is being given to Israel. And now, once they rejected Messiah, it comes and moves to the Gentile world to receive. And then it's interesting because there is a separation done between the 69 and the last one for a reason. They're not connected. There's a long period between the two 
in the last seven years, you see the Bible says in verse 27 of Daniel 9, and this, that you're talking about after that, um, uh, that um, in verse 27, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abomination will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on one who makes desolate. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about the last seven years that will be also cut into two. Three and a half, the half of the week, you see, it's going to be all about peace. It's going to be, and it's interesting because he says he will, he will increase. He will, he will make a firm covenant, but in the Hebrew, he will make a different covenant. It's not just peace. It's peace that will be involved with the resumption of temple uh, of functionality. How do I know? Because the first thing that happens right after those three and a half years, that he stops the temple's functionality. He stops that which is being done in the temple. So if the temple was destroyed after the 69 years, then speaking of the last seven years, there's a new one that is going to be built, and halfway through, it won't function anymore as the regular Jewish temple. And we know, of course, that in the book of Second Thessalonians chapter 2, he will enter the temple and declare himself as God. So now we understand that the things of the past are, of course, the destruction of the second temple. And then, of course, we have a long time period that, um, you know, Jesus described and the disciple and, of course, that the prophets did as well. And it's very interesting because um, we, 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 we can see that both Ezekiel the prophet, Isaiah the prophet, Zechariah the prophet, and in the book of, of, of um, Psalms, we see world events. And, and, and let me describe. First of all, if you think that when Jesus talked in Matthew 24 about nation rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and that's just the beginning, some people think that all that Jesus talked about had happened already right at the year 70 AD. Well, let me explain. The year 70 AD, it was in the middle of what's known as the Pax Romana, the about 200 years period of actually total peace in the Roman Empire. Of course, here and there, there were several um, attempts to, for a, a revolt, one by the Jews, others by others in the Spanish and the French area. But all in all, there were no wars. In fact, the Roman Empire was growing bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It is known ever since 27 BC all the way until um, close to the end of the second century, Pax Romana, the time of the peace in the Roman Empire. So definitely 70 AD has nothing to do with nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and all of that. That is a thing of the future. And of course, there were so many wars, and there were so many rumors of wars, and there were so many world wars. But you have to understand something. Everything that the prophets are talking about in regards to wars always has to do with the people of Israel. I know that there was World War I, there was World War II, I know there's so many other wars all across the world. Wars are actually the, uh, the product of the human nature. But what, what worries us is what the Bible talks about. And the Bible in all of the prophecies will always, always deal with Israel and Jerusalem. This is exactly what the understanding that Daniel received in the ninth chapter. Seventy weeks were determined for your people and your holy city. So yes, yes, there was World War I and World War II, but Israel was not a nation back in the land yet. So there were so many other wars all across the globe. But we need to remember that the prophecies that we need to deal with regarding wars, regarding world events, have to do 
with Israel and with Jerusalem. It is, it's part of what God says through the prophet Daniel. So when we talk about all the wars, the, you know, of Psalm 83 and, and the wars of, of, of Isaiah 17 and Ezekiel 38 and 39, we mu and of course, Zechariah 12, 13, 14, and, and even in the book of Revelation, we have to remember that Israel is the centerpiece through which God is describing world events. Jerusalem is the central location that God is talking all about. And eventually, even in the future, he will make a new Jerusalem. He will make all things new. Even then, we have Jerusalem. Now it's a new Jerusalem, but even then it's Jerusalem as the center of all that God is doing. So we have to keep that in mind. Because so many people are confusing wars in between 70 AD and today to probably be the ones that the Bible talked about. No, for almost 2,000 years, the people of Israel were away from their land and they were not back in the land as a sovereign nation in their land. They are back in their land physically in the end of the 1700s, throughout the 1800s, of course, in the, in the 1900s, the major return of the Jews as a result of World War II and, of course, um, the um, the Brits that left this place all uh, for the two sides to uh, to get along, and so we have to remember that. Now, I know that some people are waiting to see when will Psalm eighty three is going to take place. I've always said that, and I'm probably going to say that again. In my eyes, the way I understand Psalm eighty three, it has already happened. Psalm 83 is talking about the first tier of enemies of Israel around it that are bordering with Israel. It talks about Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Egypt and those that are within. The tent of Moab and the tent of Edom. And then it talks about even the Ishmaelites. Now you need to understand that it happened in 1948 where all of those countries came up upon Israel to destroy it continued in 1967 when they were about to do that and we were striking first what we call a preemptive strike. And it continued in 1973 when this time it was only Syria and Egypt that um, were sending their troops and, and, and there was a 17 days war that ended up with, with a lot of bloodshed but yet we did not lose a square inch. So my point is the era of our neighbors trying to destroy us is over. Jordan has peace with Israel. Egypt has peace with Israel. And both Syria and Lebanon are suffering from civil war that destroys their own countries from within. Tr truly, we really, we really don't need to fight them anymore. They do a much better job doing that to themselves than we, we can. I mean, if you really think about it, the number of Hezbollah, uh, terrorists that were killed in Syria is 10 times more than the number of Hezbollah terrorists that we ever killed in all of our wars together combined. So they do a much better job in, in that. So Psalm 83 cannot out of the blue happen again. If anything, take a look at what's going on in the world today. It is Egypt and Jordan that are our neighbors that are very, very friendly with us today, knowing that they have to lean even on Israel, believe it or not, to, to help them with the fight against the radical Sunni jihadist and more so radical Shiite that has a whole country behind them, and that is, of course, Iran. So the last thing they need now is Israel as is their enemies. So I need you to understand the Bible speaks of the future of Jordan and Egypt actually in a very interesting manner. They will be part of um, an alliance. I mean, the Jordanians will host the fleeing Jews from the whores of the Antichrist. And there will be a highway from Egypt to Israel, according to the book of, of Isaiah. So, Psalm 83 took place. It took place in 1948, and it took place in 1967, 1973. It's over. We're now moving to a completely different phase right now. 
the first tier of countries around Israel is actually not interested in a war with Israel. In fact, if anyone is interested in a war, are only the terrorist organizations, which right now are much more busy fighting the Shiite-Sunni battle than the Israeli-Arab uh, war. Now, some of the people are asking me, what is the difference between Al-Qaeda and ISIS? It's a very simple, simple, simple difference. Al-Qaeda's mindset is, let's first take over the different countries, and then we will establish a Muslim caliphate. ISIS says, let's establish the caliphate right now, and then spread out. That's it. They're, they're both radical Sunni jihadists, and, and just that one decided we start a state now, it's Islamic State, ISIS, and the other one is working on taking over countries from within, Arab countries from within. And this is it. Now, if ISIS is going to fall and collapse, Al-Qaeda will continue their effort of eventually doing that in their own way. So, now, after we understood that Psalm 83 is a matter of the past, let, and then after we also understood that Israel has to be there, and Jerusalem has to be there in order for all the rest to happen, now let's move to what's uh, next in Bible prophecy. I believe that, and we've said that so many times, right now, the very, um, the most delicate place around Israel that can and will collapse and explode um, and lead to something more catastrophic is the city of Damascus itself. There are fierce fights almost every day there. And if you think that, I mean, we're talking about Damascus being the second largest city in Syria, um, we're, we're, we're talking about um, a, a place that um, two-thirds of its inhabitants are gone already. We're talking about a place that two-thirds of its houses are destroyed already. But we're also talking about a place that is loaded with chemical and biological weapon. And the race is now who is going to put his hand first on those things. And if Israel will feel that um, if this is going to happen, Israel will have to act uh, uh, upon it. We are attacking almost every other week weapon cages uh, in, in Damascus, uh, but you never know what weapon is going to eventually lead to a greater explosion that will eventually bring Damascus to exactly what Isaiah said, a heap of ruins. I said before, I think two weeks ago, on my last Facebook Live, that the um, the honeymoon, the short honeymoon that Israel had with Vladimir Putin probably came to an end when it comes to um, the uh, being close with uh, with Israel. We are interested in keeping relations with the Russians okay. In fact, next week, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu will meet with Vladimir Putin, but a much friendlier president in the White House. Uh, that reaffirmed the unbreakable and unshakable shakable, um, uh, alliance between America and Israel is now a different story. And Israel goes back to its original and more natural ally in the region, which is America. But the difference between America and Russia is America is not in the Middle East anymore. America is in Iraq maybe a little bit. America may help in some areas in northern Syria and northern Iraq from the air, but the only ones that are having boots on the ground and having anti-aircraft uh, um, anti, um, systems and, and others, these are the Russians. So we have to deal with them whether we like it or not. The Russians are not happy with what they see all around. The Russians are not happy um, with um, you know, with NATO, they're not happy um, with uh, what is going on in America, and they're definitely not happy uh, with um, the decline in the prices of oil, and, and, and they're, um, they're lost in so many different areas. And therefore, the Russians are only doing their own calculation of what's best for us at the given moment. Right now, it is good for Russia to be with Israel. It's not going to be that way for too long. 
when Israel will side with America and, and when when the Russian Iranian alliance would lead the moderate Sunni world to stay away from Russia and actually cling to Israel and that's what we see is happening already a regional effort for a regional peace of Israel with those moderate Sunni countries then of course Russia will become way more hostile towards Israel so I believe Isaiah 17 is the next thing that will eventually lead to Ezekiel 38 and 39 Remember, Ezekiel 38 and 39 follows Ezekiel 36 and 37. In chapter 36, God speaks to the mountains of Israel to shoot forth their branches and yield your fruit for the coming back of the people of Israel to their land. The land was desolated. The land was a barren wasteland. And God speaks fertility. So the mass number of the Jewish refugees from the World War and from the Arab world will make it to Israel and be able to sustain itself. Then in chapter 37, he speaks of how he physically brought them back to the land of Israel, to their own soil. A soil why would he use that term, their own soil? Because the world will not recognize it as their own. God does so. And therefore, he's bringing them. And then, of course, Israel has to enter into an era of peace and prosperity. Now, as much as it's hard for some of you to understand that, Israel is the safest place in the Middle East. We were driving today. I have a group of 51 people from Calvary Chapel of East Anaheim. We're having a great time. First day of the tour, we drove from our Tel Aviv hotel right next to the embassy, the U.S. Embassy, which is still in Tel Aviv. And they were amazed to see how the embassy of the United States of America in Tel Aviv is just next to hotels and restaurants and buildings. Just the narrow streets divides between the... And, and, I've traveled around the world. I know what U.S. embassies look like. They are fortresses, unaccessible to, to people. We're talking about hundreds of yards sometimes away from the rest of the city. Not in our case. In our case, it's just like another building in the neighborhood, which means they feel safe and they feel secure. The Americans themselves, the embassy itself in Tel Aviv. Israel is safe. Israel is secure. The Israeli currency is stronger than ever. Our economy is doing wonderful. And I need you to understand, we've never had it better when it comes even to security. Now, you're probably going to say, wait a minute, I thought there were rockets falling. I thought there were some terrorists. Guys, since the, since the establishment of the State of Israel, our biggest problem was the attempt of our neighbors to annihilate us. We're talking about 1948 war, we're talking about 1956, 1967, 73. We're talking about big countries with big armies. And that's no longer there. There is no Syria anymore to attack Israel. Lebanon has its own um, horrible um, civil war. The Palestinians themselves are fighting there. Um, the, the Sunnis and the Shiites are fighting there. And they don't, they're not a threat to Israel anymore. Um, Jordan has peace with Israel. Egypt has peace with Israel. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, is basically that we have relatively peaceful time. We just found gas. We just found oil. We're exporting high tech to the whole world. Um, guys, it has never been better. Now, are we perfect? No, but show me one country. Europe is not perfect. America is not perfect. China is not perfect. Russia is not perfect. There is no place where everything is super perfect. There's always something. But we never had it better than what we have right now. So we have to understand when Ezekiel chapter 38 begins with how Israel is safe, secure, and unwalled villages, we have unwalled villages. I mean, come on. If Israel in the very beginning had to defend itself day and night from invasion of countries into it, we no longer have that. I mean, I don't have any wall around my town. The walls that we have in Jerusalem are the walls of the old city. And the only wall between us and the Palestinians is just that, that there will not be any infiltration of suicide bombers. We're not talking about invasion of countries into Israel anymore. And not at least what we have now. And of course, Ezekiel speaks of an invasion when we are safe, secure, and very prosperous. And, and the whole spirit of Ezekiel 38 is about a, a coalition of two major empires, regional empires, Turkey and Iran, 
led by a, a powerful Russia that wants to secure its interest in gas and oil in the Middle East. That probably is the hook in the jaw of Russia. Of course, when that war will come to an end, we understand that that's when Daniel is going, the prophecy of Daniel regarding those seven years, I believe, will, will take place. I believe that it's going to be Western Europe that will introduce peace to the region once the war of Ezekiel will come to an end. The war of Ezekiel may be even an exchange of nuclear um, warheads, um, but we know that religion will no longer be um, uh, an issue there when it comes to Islam, because Islam will be defeated. How do I know? If Islam is not defeated, Jews cannot build a temple on the third holiest site in the world for Muslims. It's, it's obvious. We could have built a temple if we wanted. Of course, the only reason we don't do that is because we don't want a World War III here. And we don't need more than a billion, 200 million people coming up against us. So what we're talking about is if the temple has to be built again, it will only be so when Islam is defeated and a new religion is introduced of do good, be good, and everything is great. There is no other way things can That's why I'm also opposing this whole understanding or thought that there will be an, a Muslim Antichrist. Guys, a Muslim will not allow the Jews to dominate the Temple Mount, to build a temple there, and, and, and he won't get and enter into a Jewish temple to declare himself as God. I mean, he has Al-Aqsa, he has the Dome of the Rock. As a Muslim, why would he go into the Jewish temple and do that? And, and t you tell me, why would any Jew, why would any European, why would any American will accept a Muslim with all the negative publicity of, of, of jihad to the Muslim world today, why would they accept a Muslim as a world leader? Are you kidding me? Um, they don't agree themselves on anything. They fight themselves. They kill themselves. Why would anyone? And who would it be? A Sunni or a Shiite? I mean, you understand, it makes absolutely no sense. So, we believe that uh, uh, Psalm 83 took place. Isaiah 17 is next. I believe it's around the corner. Then Ezekiel 38 and 39. And then, of course, after those seven years, when an Antichrist is going to introduce a peace. A lot of pastors stumble into this whole uh, verse 27 of chapter 9 of, of Daniel saying that he will make a firm covenant. In the Hebrew word is hegbir. He made it stronger, but he made it um, different. It, it's going to be a much greater volume. And the volume is very simple. The, the, the greater thing in the peace that the Antichrist will introduce is the key is and remember it's always Jerusalem it's always the Jewish people what is it that the Jews want to build in Jerusalem the temple and this is exactly why in verse 27 you see that it had to do with the temple now all the peace deals that are being offered right now on the table have nothing to do with any temple of any Jews I mean there's just nothing like that right now the difference between the Antichrist peace deal and a deal that Trump or Obama or Clinton or anyone before had ever offered is that the Antichrist will allow the Jews to build a temple, whereas the temple was not even an issue on the table in any peace deal before. And that is why the word increase or the word he will, um, he will make a firm covenant. It's not just a covenant for peace. It's a covenant for the Jewish people to return to what they were longing for so many years. And it's having a temple on the Temple Mount. But then, of course, we know that halfway through, it's going to be a disaster when the Antichrist will enter into the temple, as Second Thessalonians suggests, and declare himself as God. I also believe that the entire tribulation, when it comes to what God is dealing uh, with the world, it's going to be how God is going to judge the sinful world and how Israel 
is actually going to go through the fire and, and God wants them to come to know Christ. It's very, very, very simple. We know that even just by reading Romans 11, God is not done with Israel. He's not done with Israel, A, because Jeremiah 31 says so, but he's also not done with Israel because in Romans chapter 11, when, when the Apostle Paul speaks of how the Jewish people rejected Christ, and then he says, he says the following thing. He says, um, and in verse 11, he says, I say then, they, uh, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be, but by their transgression salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. And now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? And I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow... I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? There is no doubt Israel eventually will come to know Christ. The question is how many of them will and how many will not. And that's what Zechariah 13 is dealing with with it. Um, yes, we are going to experience a national salvation for Israel at the very end, but unfortunately, in that process, either by the horrors of the Antichrist himself, who will persecute them, or by their own rejection of, 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 of Christ and their own rejection of, of God's um, uh, plan of salvation, two-thirds of Israel, unfortunately, is going to perish and only the last third will survive and that which will survive is going to have a national salvation and of course the bible speaks of in zechariah uh chapter 12 how um uh, how uh, they will look at him whom they pierced the one whom they pierced the jewish people will see jesus when he comes back and they will mourn and they will cry and then in chapter 14, Zechariah talks about how his feet will stand on Mount of Olives. So, Psalm 83 took place. Isaiah 17 is next. Ezekiel 38 and 39 will take place. And then, of course, the whole prophecy of the last week of Daniel, when the Antichrist is going to come in the first uh, part of the week and introduce that peace. A fake peace, a peace that for the first time will also be in, including a temple. And then, of course, in the second part, at, according to Daniel 7, 21, he will come against uh, the saints and he will uh, be able to defeat them. Of course, the saints of the tribulation. But then, once the end of the tribulation comes, there will be that resurrection from the dead, uh, as in uh, Revelation 20 and 21. So guys, what really I want you to understand is this. The entire prophetic portions of the scriptures, everything, cannot stand by itself unless you talk about Israel and Jerusalem. Remember, Daniel received an understanding of the history of the whole world from the moment Jerusalem's walls will be the, will be restored all the way to the very end. He separated the 70 weeks into 69 and then the last, the 70th week. And then he talked about the things that happen. And then he talked about the things that will happen. And we know that history will continue until, of course, Christ is come back. And set his feet on the Mount of Olives. And then we're going to put a pause. And we're going to enter into a period of 1,000 years. That will be pretty interesting. Because we, the believers, as we return back from heaven with Christ. With, as his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. We will live throughout all those 1,000 years with him. Reigning with him on this earth. The Bible talks about that in, in the book of Revelation. But in the very end of the thousand years, we see something very, very interesting 
and very, very significant. You, you, you have to understand something, and you see that also in Daniel chapter 8. Satan is not going to be gone during the thousand years millennial kingdom. He will just be locked up. He won't be able to manifest himself during those thousand years. But he's not gone yet. Now, God is giving the whole world a period of 1,000 years to be under the leadership and the reign of Jesus himself. You would think that the people are going to all be, be saved and that they're all going to become godly people. I have bad news. <laughs> I have uh, a, a very, very bad news because the Bible says that after the thousand years, and I'm reading from Revelation chapter 20, verse 7, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. You understand that <laughs> there's the Gog and Magog that Ezekiel describes, and that is in chapter 38, and which is talking about a regional war of the second tier of countries, Iran and Turkey and Sudan and Libya, and of course it's led by Russia. But there is another Gog and Magog in Revelation, and that is, of course, the enemies, once again, of Israel. But now we're talking about from the four corners of the world. Israel by then is all saved. All Israel will be saved. We will be part of the saints, of course. And it's all going to be. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, Jerusalem. Remember, it's about Israel. It's about Jerusalem. Don't ever forget that. And then it says, and a fire came down from heaven and devoured them. In other words, even after the thousand years, when Christ is reigning, the world is still wicked. The world will still be deceived. So, you can't really tell me, oh, well, only when I see Jesus, I will believe. Or only when Satan will be gone, I will no longer have any temptation. Guys, Jesus will reign for 1,000 years. We will reign with him. And we will witness once again a great downfall of humanity. When after the thousand years are expired, they will gladly follow Satan once again. And then, of course, remember, every time God sends fire, every time God is judging people, it's not because he's into judging and he's into killing, he's into... It's the wages of their own deeds and their own sins and it's their own rebellion and rejection of God. That's what it's all about. And only then, after that fire is, is going to come down, of course, the Bible talks about the second um, resurrection, which is the great trial, of course. The first resurrection or is the resurrection of Jesus the church, us, when we go and you know into heaven, um, the rapture, and of course at the end of the um, of the tribulation, the saints of the tribulation. That's the first resurrection of Christ and the believers. The second resurrection is, of course, uh, the resurrection of the um, sinners. The Bible talks about that in Revelation chapter twenty, verse. Um, um, 13 and, uh, and it speaks how the, the sea gave its dead to him and death and Sheol gave its, their death and people all of them were judged according to their own deeds and then comes after the second resurrection the second death which is the one thing all of us do not want to experience so if you're a believer you're obviously born again so you, you took the second birth. And then, of course, your part is in the first resurrection. And you will not see the second death. How about that? So I, I, I hope that I managed to give you 
a better understanding of the prophetic future. And you need to remember, don't ever, ever separate Israel and Jerusalem from the entire picture. So again, I want to encourage all of you once again to spread the message, spread the word. Uh, the reason why we teach Bible prophecy is not to scare anyone. I always say that, as, as Dr. Heinzen said, Bible prophecy is not to scare, but it's to prepare. The only people that are scared are those that are not prepared. And the only reason why God gave Bible prophecy is to prepare the people, is to open their eyes. I shared with my group today how, you know, God gave us an understanding, just as he gave Daniel, an understanding of the things to come. You know, we know now what a Russian president is going to do. Well, I believe he doesn't know that he, himself, yet we know what he's about to do. We know what the Iranians are, go, are going to do, what the Turks are going to do. We know that. Now, they already gather their forces. They're already out there in Syria. They're already on the border with it. They don't have a clue that they're about to invade. They don't have a clue that they're about to be humiliated and destroyed. They don't have a clue. Europe doesn't have a clue that this whole Islamic invasion into Europe is actually going to cause Europe to get ready for the rise of the Antichrist from its own territory. It's very interesting because um, we know that the Russians just a couple days ago said to the Americans, don't get the lion, wake up the bear. In other words, you, the lions, don't cause the bear to wake up and, and get angry. And I was thinking about the young lions that Ezekiel 38 talks about, the young lions of Tarshish. Tarshish is Europe and England, and, and the young lions of Tarshish are those who came out of the loins of England and Europe, of course. And so it's very interesting to, to think about how even today they speak with biblical language, um, and they don't even understand that Ezekiel talked all about that uh, 2,800 years ago. So... What I'm trying to really explain is that what we know gives us two things. A, gives us authority in the way we speak to people and warn them, because we know. Two, the Holy Spirit is the restrainer. And we who have the Holy Spirit, by praying and interceding, can become part of the restraining power of things. So we have... A, the power to restrain because of the Holy Spirit in us. And two, we, um, we obviously um, speak with authority because we know what's coming next. And the reason why I, I want people to share the word. A, because I believe a lot of people are out there searching. It's no wonder why, you know, Behold Israel started just a couple, two, three years ago. And we're already... Um, spreading to more than 200 countries, not because we're so good. It's because people are so hungry. It's because the world doesn't hear the message of what is coming next, although the world wants to hear that. Even the disciples in, in Luke 20, 21, in Matthew 24, asked Jesus, what are the signs of the end of the age? And, and so I believe that there is a great hunger around the world. I believe that if you ask someone... Um, Genuinely, uh, do you feel a greater need of God in your life? And, and I know that some people do that. They ask. You'll end up on, you know, seeing that people want to have God in their life. People want to understand what's next. They want to understand what is coming around the corner. Psychic shops are all over New York City, all over the world. It's a huge business. People want to know the future. Now, we who know the end from the beginning because God declared in Isaiah 46 I am God there is no other I am God there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done God declared it through the prophets when the Bible speaks in in in, in 2nd Peter chapter 1 verses 20 and 21 the Bible says the prophecy was never given by any private interpretation of every any human being 
It's the Holy Spirit that spoke through the prophets to the people as they were moved by God. It wasn't so. So nothing here is in their interpretation of anyone, and we dare not interpret anything. Any also, when I speak about Bible prophecy, when I speak about the destruction of Damascus, I'm not thinking will Damascus be destroyed. I know it will be destroyed because the Bible tells me. I'm just thinking, okay, I wonder how, or I wonder when. But then I don't even have to deal with that anymore. I know that Damascus is sitting on the largest barrel of explosive in the world. It's obvious that it will cause its own destruction if, we, if, it, if it will pose any imminent threat to Israel. It's no doubt. I'm an Israeli. I live in my country. I see what the military is all, all about. And so when, I, when, when we, you hear about, um, about things, you have to always add to what you know in the scriptures that which you see around the world. It's very simple. And then when you add one and one, it, it, it's very, very clear, very, very simple. Now, I'm not a prophet. I always tell people I come from a non-profit organization. But I can tell you that you don't need to be a prophet in order to know the times and the seasons. You just need to read the prophets. And you need to believe the prophets. And you need to understand that all that the prophets were writing has to be fulfilled. Jesus said, everything that is they wrote concerning me must be fulfilled. So... We need to shake off all the doubts that we have, shake off all the confusion that we have. We need to stick to the Word of God. We need to read the newspapers and watch TV with a huge smile on our faces because I told you, I know so. Every time I go to a, a, a military um, um, intelligence briefing, I, I'm smiling because you know they think they're smart and they tell you so all these interesting, I guess, very, very secret, top secret things. And to me, it's not secret. To me, it's not secret at all. I can see everything in the scriptures. So I want to encourage all of you, do not despise your youth or your lack of uh, scholarship in, 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 in the Word of God. You just have to read the Word and believe the Word. It's very, very simple. Jesus did not ask from anyone to, to go to the university and, 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 and have um, a master degree in Bible prophecy in order to know what the Bible pro what the prophets meant. All we need to is to read, accept, and believe. And then you just sit back and, and, and look at, at the things and you're amazed. But we don't have the privilege of sitting back and doing nothing about it. And that is why I urge you to just spread the message. And this is why I want to combine the spreading the message with an opportunity to also to bless you guys. So I want to remind you all guys that in 2018, I'm going to bless one of you with a free Israel tour led by me. And most likely I will add you to a tour that me and Pastor J.D. Farag are planning together in November of 2018. So you will be blessed twice. And um, um, that's going to be the price of the one who wins the raffle that we're going to do. A raffle that will, um, will happen towards Passover, probably April 10. And I want you to know that apart from the first prize, which is the Israel tour that some of you or one of you will win, I will also, um, I will also um, reward the second and the third places the second one, we will pay your way to the Minneapolis, to Eden Prairie in Minnesota, um, to the Understanding the Times Conference of Jan Markell and Olive Tree Ministries. And we're going to fly you there and put you there two nights in a hotel, and you're going to attend the conference, and you can also have a lunch with me, and, and we're going to talk about Bible prophecy and about um, life. Um, and the third price is we're going to send you guys a box full of all the resources, the DVDs of Behold Israel, of my teachings, as well as a Bible, Hebrew English Bible, signed by me. And if my book, which we're in the process of finishing writing right now, which is called The Last Hour, if it will come out by then, I'm going to sign a copy and send you one of them as well. So I want to encourage you 
first of all, to register to our newsletter through our website, beholdisrael.org. Go and just put and add yourself to the newsletter. I want you to go to the Facebook page of Behold Israel and like and follow it and share. The most important thing is share. Share that post about the free Israel tour with as many people as you can and put a hashtag Behold Israel or handle Behold Israel so we can easily find you. Please go to our your YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Behold Israel, and comment on our videos with hashtag Behold Israel, then we can find you. Follow and share our Instagram, which is Behold Israel, one word. And if you follow and share and, and also comment, comment with hashtag Behold Israel. The reason why we put the hashtag is the easiest way to find you. Once we click on the hashtag, we find all the people that uh, did that. The last but not least, go to Twitter, follow us on Twitter, Behold Israel, and retweet our Twitter post about the free tour. And if, guys, if, if you do all of that, you will increase your chance to win one of the three prizes five times. Because we take names from the database of the subscribers of the newsletter. We take all the names of Twitter, all the names of Instagram, all the name of Facebook, and all the name of YouTube. And if your name is in each and every one of them, then you have five times your name in that raffle, and your chances are much higher. So I want to encourage all of you to do that. And we all do that, not because of any fame or claim. It's because we want the message to go up. And I think we need to be creative. And why, why would I ask you to share and not be able also to bless you somehow back for that? So I encourage you to do that. And I love you from Galilee. Thank you for your prayers, for your support. Thank you for responding to our call to donate for the young adults scholarships. We managed to bring 10 to 12 young adults for free, part of the 45 young adults that will be in Israel in May. Uh, and we're going to take them around and we're going to just give them Bible, give them Jesus, give them uh, prophecy and send them back home to their colleges and to their universities and to their countries. We have people from Japan and the Philippines, people from Europe, people from the UK, people from America and South America. People ask me, how about Africa? We got no applications from Africa. If we would have, we would have considered that. We need you guys to write us and maybe for next year's young adult, just get us uh, your application, write to Info at BeholdIsrael.org and we will glad you, we will gladly uh, include you. We, we, we really want to get people from all four corners of the world. And um, we would appreciate if you continue to give towards that and, and also be part of our ministry. I, I want to create um, from every country uh, some Behold Israel coordinator that will facilitate eventually not only the spreading of, of the teaching, but also when I come to visit and speak, he will help me putting together the different uh, places. And eventually what I will do, all the coordinators from all the f countries that we will have, I will bring them to Israel to get them to understand what it's all about. So pray about it if you want. Write to us to info at Behold Israel, writing your name and writing also where you're from. Thank you again. God bless you, and shalom from the Sea of Galilee, from Israel. God bless you guys.